I've never been to a World Cup draw before. That's FIFA going in. The people running world football. All the coaches are here. It's a, a bit of a glamour event, actually. When we got our fans behind us, we, we feel we can beat anyone. También es una risita nerviosa por lo que está por suceder, ¿no? This has been a political story for the last 12 years. The scrutiny and the eyeballs that have been on the Qatari state, but now the football enters the fray. Have you taken a look at the stadium? Yeah, a few, few stadiums already, and uh, wow. Pierre-Luigi Colina just arriving here. One of the most famous referees. For this World Cup, you can be an Argentinian fan. We have for you these t-shirts. <laughs> it really is an exciting moment. A World Cup's still a special thing, the most special tournament in the world. And I can't wait. This is the night where the World Cup takes shape. The story of the Qatar World Cup is one of the most extraordinary in football. The tiny country is on the peninsula in the Gulf, bordering Saudi Arabia and a short flight from Dubai. Qatar has spent 11 years and around $160 billion building seven new stadia, hundreds of miles of roads and metro lines transforming its capital Doha. It's a chance for the Middle East to stage a World Cup and showcase the region. But this country is very different to any previous World Cup host and by far the most controversial. The country is taking small steps towards democracy, but it's ruled by a monarchy. There are huge issues and questions on women's rights and homosexuality remains illegal. Then there's its record on workers' rights and freedoms. Three years ago, I was invited over by the World Cup organising committee to see how they were preparing, on the condition that nowhere was off limits and that I'd have full editorial independence. Now I'm back to see how the World Cup really is transforming this country and how human rights and freedoms have changed. When you look at the stadiums that have been built over here, I mean, they're absolutely out of this world. They're absolute architectural masterpieces. Zaha Hadid designed that stadium and it's a thing of beauty, really. The Qataris employed a who's who of big name architects, like the British architect Norman Foster, whose firm designed this. The La Salle Stadium is magnificent and it will host the World Cup final on Sunday the 18th of December. So this is the VVIP entrance. So that's uh, heads of state, uh, dignitaries, and it's a security distinction, operationally speaking. If the Prime Minister was to come here for the first game, Qatar v England, like coming through here, would it? It would, it would indeed. Gary Neville, VIP or IP? <laughs> Am I just P? <laughs> Should we go in? Yes, indeed. So Gareth Southgate, he wins his first game. Where does he go for his press conference from here? Just down here. And it's that door on the right over there. Oh, oh. 300 to 320 here journalists can fit here. There's the head table. This is the uh, press, conference, press room. conference room, which the managers will come in, the players will come in straight after if they're doing the official interviews. This is not a happy place. My lasting memory of post-match press conference was the 7-0 in Barcelona in the new Camp. And it wasn't a particularly pleasant experience. Maybe you could show a little bit on the documentary. Do you think it would be logical for you to be dismissed after Valencia's performance tonight? Next question, please. When it says Emir facilities, is that just for the Emir himself? Private lounge. Just for himself? Yeah. Can we go in or not? It'll be locked now. It generally stays locked. Okay. Let me try. Yeah, yeah it's, it's locked. locked. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not for security anyway. It's just a security requirement, yeah. yeah. that's why. So this is yeah. the VIP lounge? So you'll only be here by invitation. Okay. Okay. And this takes 1,800 to 2,000 people. It's British. like a five-star hotel. And what's the cost of this stadium? So the entire development, the stadium and the 100 hectare precinct around yeah. it to absorb all the yeah. people, operational yeah. logistics and the 100,000 people that are going to come in, all of it all together is around about a billion dollars. A billion dollars. So similar to the cost, well, it's less expensive than Tottenham. Yeah, I believe so, yes. And what's the capacity of the stadium? So 80,000 unobstructed seats. That's view unobstructed completely. Yes. If you count the seats physically that are installed, you go, you go north of 90,000. Oh my gosh. 
This is where you and I stood the last time you were here. Wow. Three and a half years ago. So it must have been June 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Having just walked in here now at first glance, this is absolutely breathtaking. The seven new stadia are nearly ready, but the one thing you won't find that easily are bars. Qatar is about to be swamped by around one and a half million football fans. And it's fair to say, and a fair few of them like a drink. I love the souk. This is where we came last time. And this is likely to be where one of the fan parks is. So this big square here, this huge, big, vast open space, you probably get about three or 4,000 people in this space. The issue around here will be actually alcohol and whether alcohol is permitted. The issue for the Brits is always alcohol. The organisers have said alcohol will be available before games in dedicated fan zones, but exactly where, we don't know. At the moment, you can only buy alcohol in the top-end hotel bars, and it's not cheap. You've said previously that alcohol would be available in certain parts of Qatar during the tournament. So I think you're the man to ask, can fans drink alcohol in this stadium? I mean, we've had you know, extensive discussions with FIFA and so on, the sponsors, um, and, and the decision is like within the stadium, uh, it won't be available. It will be available in the fan zones, it will be available in other areas outside, but within the stadium it wouldn't be available. And can you just explain you know, why alcohol is not available and not going to be available in the stadiums? Alcohol is not part of our culture as an Arab Muslim nation. Having said that, hospitality is part of our culture and accordingly you, know, you find alcohol available in certain areas. The principle of not having alcohol in the stadium is not something that's unique only to us. A lot of other nations in their day-to-day -day or weekly leagues actually don't allow alcohol in the stadiums. There's a number of different examples that we can mention. That's one aspect. But for us specifically, uh, you know, as an Arab country, alcohol is not part of our culture. So alcohol will be available in fan zones and some hotels where taxes are really high. In one of these hotels, I bumped into an FA delegation doing a pre-tournament recce. I've been here four times now. I don't, as you know, don't drink when I'm away, but I've been seeing people drinking, I've seen people having good times. It, it is a bit of a myth that you can't do this stuff. I think every World Cup poses certain issues. There's concerns about different cultures, um, how England fans in particular are going to deal with alcohol, say. Um, we know how to deal with alcohol, uh, don't we? Yeah, but <laughs> in a country where it, it's yeah. not very relaxed. Um, but everything that I've seen on the visits that I've been, the Qataris just want to make everybody as welcome as they can. They're, they're very open in saying, this is our house. We do have some rules that we live by, but you're welcome. Qatar, unlike its neighbour Dubai, isn't used to mass tourism and the country doesn't have enough hotel rooms for the tournament. It's a massive issue. But they've come up with some innovative temporary solutions. A huge new cruise terminal has been built and the plan is to dock two liners to house fans. Shall we say that I'm not a sailor? <laughs> I once travelled to an England under-18s game over in France across the channel on a ferry and it just didn't go down well, so I've tried to stay clear of it since. And I certainly won't be staying in the uh, cruise liner in the World Cup. It's not my game. But I'm really looking forward to actually seeing one because I've never been on one in my life. Wow. Wow. This is not a boat. 100 metres of promenade. Pretty spectacular. How many people can stay on this ship? The maximum capacity is 6,354 guests. 6,350 guests? Yes. Wow! Plus 1,700 crew members. We all laughed, didn't we, when we thought they could put fans on a boat? But they can. <laughs> 6,000 people? I mean, I have to say, it's absolutely spectacular. It's nothing like I'd imagine. Should we have a walk down the promenade? Yes, let's go. Let's have a look. You've got shops, you've got restaurants, yes. you've got bars. I mean, look at this. Wow. So it's a steakhouse? Yes. Bistro Indochine. Japanese restaurant. Up we go. How many stories? 19. How many? Eh? 19. 19 stories? Yes. 
Do you have an English pub? Of course, this oh. is your place. Oh, here we go. This is why I bring you to here. Wow, the English pub. Hey, where are you lads from? And ladies? Manchester. Manchester, Berry. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah from the <laughs> Do you um, enjoy it? Yeah, love it. How long, how long have you been on? Great cruise. Just nearly yeah, a week. Yeah, we've, oh, we've got a couple of days, days left. Days left Amazing. Go. Okay. Amazing yeah. shit. Would you think that it'd be good for fans during the World Cup to stay on this and then obviously yeah, go to the absolutely. game? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. It's yeah. a place to get off and go to, of yes. course. I'd say it's an amazing place. First time I've ever been on one, I can't believe really? it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm like, shit, I can live on here. Yeah. It's good, yeah, isn't it? You meet people from Bury, where you come from, where you were born, on a cruise ship in Qatar. Yeah. How's that work? And Tottington as well. And Tottington as well. Yeah, right down the road, yeah. just around the corner. We've got a karaoke, we are the champions, about to be uh, performed. We are the champions, okay. Here we go. He's taking his mask off. Oh dear, he's struggling. So all this apparently the evening when there's a football match on turns into tables, chairs and the match goes on the big screen. You can see there in the background where that guy's having a horrific time of it with We Are The Champions. I can imagine that this would be an incredible atmosphere in a World Cup with fans, with people enjoying themselves, watching the matches, obviously the sun. Security's a factor, different fans from different nations, drinking too much, but let's look at the positive for now, that you've got an incredible facility that will house thousands of people during the World Cup. That's 12,000 beds sorted, but that still leaves a massive shortfall in hotel rooms. In terms of the accommodation, where are these rooms going to appear from <laughs> for all these fans? Not just England fans, but all these fans. There's definitely enough here from what we're being told. 130,000. 130,000. And you've got to understand as well that as soon as the group stages are done, you know, that demand drops yeah, off a cliff. Course. So that first two yeah. weeks is the big challenge, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. And, and you know, as far as we're concerned, they've got enough accommodation and ranging from cheap options to, to beach camping, which I'm sure Tony <laughs> would be interested in if he was coming out. There we go. Love that. I love that. Look at that. I want one of them. Imagine me running around Bolton in one of them. This is Qatar. The whole of Qatar will have been like this probably up until 25, 30 years ago. Other than the area around Doha, most of Qatar is desert. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's here that around 3,000 fans could be sleeping in tents. Where will the accommodation be? Uh, so the accommodation will be here. On the, uh, on facing, yeah, this okay. is where the bungalows will be. OK. And here we will have some villas. We created a lot of seating space for people. People can dine here, people can use the sun beds. How far is it to the stadiums from here? About one hour? Around one hour, yes. And fans will be able to walk around with their tops off, singing songs, no problem? Yes, absolutely, yes. It is a very, very diverse uh, okay. country and uh, these things will make a big difference, yes. So this would be the lounge? Yes. You'll have the screen on with the matches, maybe? Yes, fine. So will you serve alcohol here? No, uh, we don't serve alcohol. The desert is like a traditional place okay. for the Qataris, and so here it's, it's not served at the moment. So the fans who want to have a drink will not be able to come here and stay? Uh, right now, no, we, we, we are still not still dry. Yes. yes, it's still dry, yes. OK. I think we are one of the only nations that continually ask about alcohol because we are driven by alcohol as a nation and it's aligned with football. It's a little bit like going to the chippy and not having chips, basically. They've got a bit of work to do to get these camps ready and they're miles out of town. But they're hoping a bit of traditional food and entertainment will tempt fans looking for something other than skyscrapers. So we've got a goat. Apparently we've got four hours slow cooked goat. So this is a traditional way of cooking the goat, yeah? 100% yeah, yeah, yes. tradition. And it's, it's still used today? Until now, Until now of course, yeah. we celebrate with this. So this is like the equivalent of a roast beef in England, a New Yorkshire pudding. Our Friday like your Sunday, exactly. Yes. Our Sunday like your Monday. Yes. He choose for you the best, you know, pieces. <laughs> How is it? Good, honestly. If I was growing up in Bury, you'd offer me goats and rice. <laughs> 
goat and rice. Well, very nice. An experience. First time I've ever had a goat in my life. I've never been referred to as the goat either. <laughs> Next time, camel. Camel? Oh, no. no, no. <laughs> When it comes to culture, Qatar's first football clubs only appeared in the 1950s, but the game has taken off. The country won the Asia Cup in 2019 and is rising up the international rankings. One reason for the success is this place, the National Aspire Academy, which trains all the professionals in the country. Former Everton player Tim Cahill is sporting director and he's got a big desk. How are you? Good, good. Good Gary, to see you. You too. How's How long, things? Great. How long have you been here? Three years, but one oh. year full time. One okay. Year full time, yeah. You enjoying it? Yeah, loving it. It's amazing. It's amazing. So tell us a little bit about it. Chief of Sports. Yeah, Chief Sports Officer. I suppose what I would say, helping the kids to follow their dreams from the country. Without this academy, there wouldn't be no national team, which means there'll be no World Cup. I hope you enjoy it. And How have you gone from becoming so nasty with that elbow to becoming so articulate and talking about sort of processes and things it, like that? It hasn't that? taken you long, right? It hasn't <laughs> taken you long. But you know what? Honestly, what I've done is, is I've come here and they've allowed me to study. So I've yeah. done my pro licence, my A licence here. I coached with the 16s. I then started working through to the executive level. And you've got someone special for me to meet, haven't you? Someone very special. <laughs> this is, is pretty much... Fallback? This is uh, a fullback. Yeah, but he actually got full forward and crossed it, crossed it into the box, <laughs> you know, with an end product. Does he, yeah? This is uh, Abdul Karim Abdul Hassan. Abdul, great to see you, OK? Are you this OK? Is, this is one of our national treasures. Dani on the side, Hakimu can do it. Can do it, he can do it. No, 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 Guitar uh, system, the, the Aspire Academy. Uh, since uh, 2006. How old were you when you first came here to this academy? Um, 13, 14. 13, 14. Yeah, how, yeah. how many players have come? How many players have come through the Aspire Academy that are in the actual Qatar national team now? All of them. Right now, pretty much 90 percent. Uh, yes, yeah, 90%, nearly everyone 90%, has been a yes. part of this. And you've got months to go. The excitement must be building. Uh, sure, we are a, a lot of uh, exciting uh, between us, also here in the country. And uh, we are waiting, you know. I, I, I cannot imagine how it will be, but uh, sure, to be a grateful moment. Yeah, and there's different types of psychology and all this sort of stuff. And that's probably one of the nicest things about it. It's the whole education, it's the whole process. It's not just football. Okay. 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 Thank you. Great, Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. She's a left back, yeah? yeah? Good size for a left back. Been to Belgium, to the Belgium club, yeah. Aspire isn't just home to the men's team. Qatar now has a women's team that's competing internationally. Hi, Soed. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Are women allowed to go to watch football matches yeah, openly yeah. in Qatar? Yeah, and always, a long time ago. Always been the case? Yeah, a long time ago. The first match I went to Khalifa Stadium with my mother and my father. <laughs> and our team lost, but his team won, so he was happy. <laughs> And that's how you got into football, was that how you... Yeah, I used to play with my brothers in the neighbourhood and uh, I wasn't allowed. <laughs> my father used to yell at me, don't go playing with the boys, don't go playing. <laughs> but I organised my life. When he goes to sleep, I go play in school and then come back. <laughs> so in terms of football, has it got a big future in Qatar, do you think? And how far can it go? For the women, yeah, it is a big... Every year the teams increase. Every year I see more and more girls that I didn't see the year before. So I think the football is developing in Qatar. Yeah. Uh, it's slowly, but it's developing. Yeah. Yeah. Women are playing football, but even in Doha's newest areas like Musharib, you realise that in public, men and women are very often separate. Hi, Farah, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Should we go and sit down? Yes, please. Farah Eshmael is from Canada and presents sports news on Doha-based Al Jazeera. I wanted to know what life is like for Western women living in Qatar. Well, I moved over here over a decade ago. Things were very different when I moved over here. It was a lot more conservative than I thought it was going to be, like going out to the mall. 
Um, I remember being approached a couple of times in the mall and being told off about what I was wearing. It was nothing risque. It yeah. was, you know, it was like maybe I was showing a bit of shoulder. I remember going to the grocery store and having, you know, men follow me around, but not in a, not in a aggressive kind of way. It was more like just curiosity. Why would they follow you around? Just because it was unusual. There wasn't very many Western women here. So it was, okay. it was different. And I think I, I stuck out a lot. But over the years that's changed since the World Cup. I think a lot of people have moved in to work on the World Cup. There's a lot more Westerners and attitudes have changed. It's become a lot more relaxed. I think, you know, being a woman, it's very safe here. I feel safe going out uh, alone at night, walking down the street. I've never been hassled. I would feel completely comfortable going out alone, like to a bar or a restaurant. I wouldn't yeah. hesitate to do that. Lots of female fans, football fans will come over here and they will, you know, it's going to be warm. They will be obviously having their shoulders on display. You know, football fans do. Will let not me be. give you, let me give you an example. Okay. Back in 2019, pre pandemic, Qatar hosted the club world cup. There were fan zones that had alcohol. South American fans were doing what South American fans do and Liverpool fans were doing the same thing. And it was amazing. That was a football match that you would hope and expect a football game would be. And it's only going to be better during the World Cup. That was just a little taste of what it's going to be. And it was great. I think, you know, no one's going to stop you from doing anything. But I think there should be some respect for the cultural values here. I think that's just something that you should do anywhere. Women's rights in Qatar are progressing, but there are still inequalities. And when it comes to same-sex relationships, the authorities say they'll allow rainbow flags, but being gay remains against the law. If a married couple from Manchester came to the World Cup and they were kissing in the street after a game, what would happen? It's important to highlight first, whether it's a gay couple or otherwise, public display of affection is not part of our culture overtly embracing each other it's it's you know it's they will be told to stop it's again it's not a yes i think these are these are questions these are, that will no, be asked. no they're very important no they're very important questions they're, they're vital questions it's just i think they are vital questions during the tournament very plain and simple everybody's welcome in qatar the simple fact is everybody's welcome but in the nature of being a good guest is always to understand you know the country that you're visiting or the home that you're visiting or the people that you're visiting and understanding and appreciating the nuances appreciating the differences in opinions or differences in values that we may have, understanding that we do have differences in opinions and try to find the commonality. We don't necessarily see eye to eye in things, but provided that we treat each other with respect, that is the most important element. That is what we want people to come out here, creating a bond on a human to human level, developing mutual respect amongst each other. The message seems to be homosexuality and any displays of affection are illegal, but we'll turn a blind eye for fans and tourists for the World Cup. Will a lot of couples, gay and straight, think it's too great a risk? Have you got that clarity from Qatar that our LGBTQ fans in the UK, England, can come over and enjoy this tournament? In writing, yes, absolutely. They're promising us that. And they've promised that to every nation. And it seems very clear cut. I think the main concern from the community is that the information they're hearing, whether it's lip service or whether it's genuine, and I think the main thing they want to they want to see is kind of you know actionable things from the people here from the kind of officials that's something we were on the call of them very recently that's something they pushed to us and it's something that um, i think you know we need to kind of look for do i think everything's perfect in Qatar? absolutely not there is a lot that needs changing over here my line has always been you either work with nations or you say that you're not going to work with them and you're going to isolate yourselves from them. I don't believe that's the way in which change and progress happens in life. The way in which nations like Qatar approach women, the LGBTQ communities, their attitudes towards workers' rights, human rights. I'd rather have dialogue. You know, I've met a lot of people from Qatar and from the Middle East over the last 20 years through my football and I've always had good conversation with them. We're on a different page politically but I've always had good conversation with them and that should still be able to happen in this world. Qatar has incredibly low crime figures, but with all eight stadiums within a 50 mile radius and most fans staying in Doha, there is potential for fan trouble. 
The Qataris are hoping that surveillance technology built into their brand new infrastructure will help manage the crowds. Wow. You've got the best security box in the world. Well, don't they? You know, His Highness changed it twice. She said, why are you taking this? This could be, you know, for the guests and stuff. But definitely, it's, it's very important for us. Yes. To really monitor physically, you know, the movement and everything. How many cameras do you have in the whole of the city for the World Cup? Including stadiums? I think 250,000. 250,000, a quarter yeah. of a million cameras. Exactly. Observing the, the fan movements. The, yeah. The whole. National teams, when they move from their hotels, I have three means of monitoring them. I have actually cameras in the hotel once they get into yes. the bus. I have a mobile camera in the patrol car right in front of them. Each is intersection. I have a camera to really monitor them that they are safe, yeah. everything like that. You know, I watch them until their locker room. Wow. They've hired 40,000 additional security guards for the games and have been working closely with other national police forces. Oh, and it's still illegal to be drunk in public. What sort of force will the police and the security services deploy? Gary will not get involved until something goes out of control. But when it got, if it did go out of control, what would happen then? Definitely, we will have, you know, we will have forces sitting right by the, you know, the, the incidents where it has to take control of it to completely. You know, we are ready to respond to any incidents. You know, but we have, we don't want to really interrupt the entertainment. We have to respect the public law. This is one thing. Whether I am here or in England or anywhere in the world. Other than that, if this individual does not harm himself or not his danger on himself by over drinking or something like that, or he does not really harm anybody else, or he did not really damage any public, you know, uh, property, capacity, then he will be safe. After all, this individual coming to watch the game, whatever it's happened, I have to solve the problem rather than escalate it. <laughs> You don't want me on security. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble, run! <laughs> the police have been told to adopt a lenient position and to recognise for a month that this is a different Qatar. You have to turn a blind eye to certain things, but actually you can't control every element and there still might be police who decide to intervene on a certain point and that becomes a big issue. It might be police not understanding actually the right of a fan to choose to protest in a part of a country, to hold a flag, or purely, actually, there is that sort of, you know, misunderstanding. They're still putting the finishing touches to the stadiums. Over 30,000 workers, mostly from South Asia, have spent nearly 11 years to get this country ready. Workers are housed next door in these temporary dormitories. Which building is it? Any building. Let's go in any. Let's... We'll go in a couple, yeah? We'll go in one or yeah, two? Yeah, you can walk through. OK. I wanted to see if conditions have improved since my last trip, and the government agreed to lay on a visit. Hi. 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 Sorry. So this is the workers' accommodation, essentially a shipping container. You've got this sort of cloth that's pulled round the bed, and that's it. Hi, nice to meet you. It's just difficult because they are all in bed, aren't they? I don't like waking people up. Hi, you speak English? You speak English or a little bit? You work, you work on the stadium. Yeah. yeah? He doesn't know his English, so I'll be translating okay. his English. Okay. How long have you been in Qatar? I'm not in Qatar. I'm in Qatar for 6 years. He has been living in Qatar for 6 years. 6 years, okay. Working on this stadium? This stadium for 4 years. In this stadium oh. since 4 years. And what role has he had? He's an electrician. He is an electrician. From whereabouts are you from? Where are you from? India, sir. India, sir. India, India okay. How many people do you share in your accommodation with? In a room, how many people are you? Four. Four. So Four. Si sim similar to this? Similar. Uh, the total establishment is the same. Like, are, are you happy with the accommodation that's being provided? You have to get the accommodation here. How is it? Is it good? Is it good? Is it good? Yes, it's good. 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 Yes, it's
Nice. It's nice? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's happy with the medicine. Okay. Okay. It's frustrating. It's hard to have a proper conversation when you rely on translators and supervisors to show you around. The workers' accommodation. It's a porter cabin with four curtains in and two lockers on each side, obviously one for each of the workers. I mean, the wealth in this country and that level of accommodation for people who are... I mean, the sacrifice that they're making you know, people giving up 10, 15 years of life to live like this, to send money back to countries where they're far worse off than they are even here. It's just inequality like you wouldn't believe. It's staggering, really. If it's not right, this is not a home. Do you know the accommodation? I really struggle with it. Tell me. Have you seen it? The accommodation? Do you struggle with the accommodation that people are living in? No. What we provide them is, apart from the room and the, the facilities inside, they get free transport to the to town on Fridays. They have a shop here. They have free laundry here. They have free Wi-Fi here. They get well looked after, plus the free meals. And I will take you to the dining halls as well. The biggest story for Western media around this World Cup has been working conditions. The Guardian newspaper put the number of migrant worker deaths at 6,500 since Qatar won the World Cup. The Guardian article that everyone refers to, the 6,500 deaths. The inaccurate, unfortunately, you know, inaccurate article. But yes, the 6,500 deaths that have happened over a period of 10 years is a combination of all members of these nationalities, whether they were laborers, whether they were children, whether they died from a car crash, whether they died from a heart attack, doctors, nurses, middle management, everybody. That was the 6,500 number that came out. It did not uh, break it down in terms of construction workers or otherwise or so on. So the impression it gave to the world is that 6,500 workers died building the stadium when that's not the case. You said three last time. How many are we in now? Terms of, in terms of workers? On construction stadiums. Yes. Three work-related, 36 non-work-related deaths. Every death matters. But unfortunately, damage is already done. The number's gone out. The impression people have made is 6,500 deaths, and that's the number that goes around. The Qatari government invited the International Labour Organization, the ILO, which is part of the United Nations, into the country to help with its migrant labour laws. Max, great to meet you. Max Tunon is the Qatari representative. I met Hassan Halfawadi, who is the Secretary General of the World Cup here, and he said that there were three known deaths on construction sites. Which number is it? 6,500 or three? So firstly, when it comes to the 6,500 figure, I think it's important to note that this is the total number of deaths of South Asian nationals over a period of 10 years. So there's no distinction made between those who died for work-related reasons or those who died for other causes. But how do we not know? We must know how someone dies. So, yeah, and, that, and one of the issues is that too many death certificates put the cause of death as cardiac arrest or death from natural causes. And so one of our recommendations is that there is a need for better investigation of, of deaths and the better classification of deaths that may in fact be work-related so that action can be taken against the employer, workers and their family members can get compensation. Is your feeling that it's a lot higher than three? So. I believe that three is the number of deaths on World Cup sites. We looked at the way in which the government is collecting data and how it needs to be improved. So in 2020, we found that there were 50 work-related deaths, 506 severe injuries work-related, and 37,000 mild and moderate work-related injuries. Over the past two years, labor laws have been reformed in Qatar. There are fewer barriers on changing jobs and no more agents' fees. But there are still no trade unions, and organisations like Amnesty say the rules aren't properly enforced. What were the main complaints? By far, the biggest complaint relates to non-payment of wages and end-of-service benefits, not receiving their benefits at the end of their contracts. Then, when workers could change jobs freely, there were complaints that their employers were retaliating against them, saying that they couldn't change. 
Now those complaints have been reduced. There is a decline there because the government has become more effective in handling the, the transfer of, of workers from one employer to another. Still, we see issues around wage payment, but the infrastructure now is in place. An online complaints mechanism, new labor courts, conciliation process, as well as a fund that will pay workers uh, if their employers are insolvent. The World Cup has accelerated the reforms. You know, there's not many countries in the world that have implemented so much, done so much in such a short period of time. Chances are, if you're lucky enough to make it over to the World Cup, you won't see as many construction laborers. Lots will have gone home before kickoff. But you will still come across migrant workers in the hotels, venues, shops and restaurants. How many workers will you need for the World Cup to be able to fuel the sort of fans that are coming in? That's, that's a good question. It's a significant amount. I mean, currently, currently we're anticipating about 100,000 plus workers. Yeah. But those numbers are still a work in progress. They try yes. to really pin it down. On the construction side, we had 30,000 yeah. yes. maximum workers at peak yeah. on the stadiums. Okay. So you see the scale. The biggest change in the treatment of migrant labour is the recent introduction of a minimum wage. It's the first in the region. On top of that, employers also have to provide food and accommodation. You've got a minimum of $275 a month for a salary, which is about £220, you know, £55 per yes. week. It feels a little bit uncomfortable. Right. In fact, it feels very uncomfortable. You only yeah. say that because, yeah. you know, when I come to buy, say, for instance, if I come and buy a bowl of pasta with a beer or a, a soft drink and a coffee, that's a week's wages. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had extensive surveys talking to workers to see exactly the impact of this particular minimum wage on their families. By and large, by and large, A, they were very receptive to the minimum wage, there's no doubt. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the workers are here to make as much money as possible. Yeah. They do a lot of savings, there's no doubt about it. How much would they send back? I would say upwards of 85% goes back home. So let's say 80% goes back yes. out of the 275. Yes. That's leaving them with $50, $55 a month to spend. Qatar labor law allows for working in overtime. And overtime is not just simply one time, it's one and a quarter during the week, yeah. or it's one and a half if you work on the weekend. Right. And not to mention the tips that we talked about in the hospitality sector. But I still can't get my head around this sort of number, this $275 a month. Yeah. You know, if that was my son, my daughter, my yeah. brother, I, you know, I wouldn't want them to be in this position. Take into consideration the overtime, take into consideration food and lodging. Yes. This is a more than fair, non-discriminatory, first of its kind in the region, minimum wage. The hotel we were in, La Cigale, is run by a French company, Accor. They've got a huge contract, including hotels and temporary World Cup apartments. Look at this. This is what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. If you want to try sample it, that's right. They say they pay above the minimum wage of $200 a month plus food and accommodation. How do you get your staff? Where well, you I'm get... a team member. I get from an international uh, agency. Okay. Depend which country we are. Uh, okay. We are looking to it. And then now, you train them. You train uh, we them. We train them. But most of our staff is mostly from Arab country and okay. from Asia. We okay. have a Filipino, Indian. There is no local working here. No. 100% is expatriate. You'll have to excuse me here. I'm about to put on my hotelier hat and ask about EBITDA. That's earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. Basically, profit. Your EBITDA as a profit margin is? The return to the owner okay. is around 35 to 40%. That's high though, eh? Is in, high? In, in UK and Western world, you'd never, no, no, you'd no, never no. get no, this No, because money. your cost of people, of, of the, the human resource is much, much higher than here. Could you not ask your owner to decrease? the EBITDA from 35, say, to 25, which is still a fantastic level, uh, and give more to in pay, in staff cost? It could be, could be, but every hotel has to follow the same uh, grid of salary pay scale. So it's a, it's a, it's a block? It's a, it's a block. Let's say if oh, you pay yeah. a waiter $10, in another hotel, it's the same amount, $10. We don't want to be so unbalanced, that, otherwise the people that will run away, they will go to so different that, hotels. I know, but that's the free market. That's what we live in. You know, uh, people can get better, you know, yeah, more yes, money. Yes, of course, of course. But we talk between general manager and true. But that the, feels like you're locking people into a location that they can't go and, you know, go from a three-star hotel to a four-star to a five-star. I have two hotels, so a 35% profit is very high. The employers, can they come over here and drive the standards as well? They can yes. drive the pay if they want to. It's not just the responsibility of, of Qatar, but of the employer and the hotel groups as Absolutely. well. To, 
to That's drive the standards. Private sector have the a big role to play. Sector, the private sector have a role to play. Absolutely. You know, this is a French organisation, huge organisation living in the Western world. They've got to take responsibility for their practices as well. Absolutely. And that's what makes me a little bit more uncomfortable than almost, if you like, the public authorities sometimes. Yes. The disparity in salaries between the Qatari nationals, the international workforce from Western Europe and America versus the labour workforce from North Africa and Southeast Asia. It's one of the largest gaps that you'll ever see. And there's no need for it, really, because this is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. What the workers need, more than anything, is for the spotlight to remain on this issue beyond the World Cup. The first game of the World Cup will see Qatar play Ecuador. It feels like the calm before the storm. Everything's almost ready, but you just can't quite imagine it. But this has to be my favourite stadium. The other stadiums are like pearls and sort of like very polished. This is rugged, raw, authentic, brilliant. And then you've got that view right the way over to the city of Doha, which is absolutely spectacular as well, which is the sort of the night scene. This stadium is called 974, 974 after the country code of Qatar, but there's also 974 shipping containers that form the structure. I think this is the stadium that will blow everyone away more than most in the tournament. What's keeping you up at night? Just really making sure that it's, it's the best that it can be. Honestly, for me to make sure that the fan experience is top notch in terms of the quality of football, enjoying the stadium and really getting to enjoy the experience around Qatar. So all eight stadiums 100% complete? All eight stadiums, all training sites complete. All the major road networks are complete, except there's some work that's happening on the Kroniche, yeah. which is the main artery, yeah. but that would be ready in May. And all the training bases are ready, the training grounds, the facilities? Absolutely ready. We expect that there's going to be a lot of demand from the region. Qatar is four hours away from around two billion people. Um, very accessible in terms of the airport being a hub. Mm. The number of flights that come in here, from all around the world. Demand is big. I want England to play here. I definitely want England to play here. We'll put in that request. We'll yes, please. If Gary you Neville has requested that England plays here. <laughs> Just a few miles down the coast from 974, there's a nice little fishing town called Al Wakra. And I was a bit surprised to find out who's staying here. If you said, where are we? We're obviously at a construction site, but then across the road over here, we've got a pretty, like say, basic looking entrance to a building and I've just been told that that is the FA's choice of team headquarters for England for the World Cup in Qatar and it's not jumping, I'm not feeling it at this moment in time. So let's go and have a look. So here we are, the entrance. The cakes are a bonus, I'm, I'm, I'm turned already. Neville and Rooney would have been stuck right into them in the day. Straight into the chocolate cake. Sorry Wazza. Right, let's have a look outside. Oh. Right. The England team are going to have this space to themselves. The weather's going to be similar now in the World Cup. 22 degrees, 21 degrees. Pleasant, running water, nice areas to sit. You know, private. Read a book. Go on your iPad. Have a lie down. The more I've come inside, it's got these little anti-spaces that I think are important. Very Arabic, very local. The last thing you want when you're away in a base for a World Cup is to be in a massive hotel with hundreds of guests where you feel like you can never escape from the tournament. This does feel like the players will be able to get away from it. OK, so let's go and have a look at room 181. So here we go. This is a little courtyard space. This would be where your manager, your captain, it certainly wouldn't be where Gary Neville would be put in. Ah, very local interior design, nice little lounge. In through into the bedroom. Oh, look, we have love in this room. We have the towel art. There you go, the English rose. I'd be really happy with this look. You know, I was an awkward sod when I played. I was really into the fact that the rooms had to be 
the right quality, the base had to be good, and maybe we thought too much about that rather than concentrating on winning the tournaments and the games. But, you know, you're going to be here for five, six weeks. It's a long time, unless you get knocked out early. You think about the local prayers that are occurring now, and that will happen during the World Cup, won't it? And w at what times of the day will local pra uh, prayers five, take place? Five times of the day. Five times of the day? Yeah. In the morning? In the is morning, it... and then you have in the afternoon. And so what's five... What time is the first one in the morning? Morning, as of now, it's 5am. Uh, 5am? Yeah. That's interesting because I mean, it's, it's, I love it, the idea of this sort of, you're surrounded by local culture and traditional setting that we've got. But at five o'clock in the morning, the players will obviously hear the prayers and that'll be interesting to see how they maybe you know deal with that but that's where we are we're in Qatar and it, it is going to happen uh, and should happen obviously it's not going to stop for the England team that's this World Cup in lots of ways Qatar is a Middle Eastern Muslim country and it's hosting a tournament that has its roots in Western liberal culture I've got no doubt this is going to be a successful World Cup for fans, for players. We have to hope, we have to feel that all this investment that they've put into this World Cup, all the trust that has been given to them, has an impact beyond football. No country is perfect. The World Cup has accelerated positive changes in Qatar, but there is still such a long way to go. Change must continue in the build-up to this tournament but more importantly, beyond, to create a meaningful and lasting legacy.